on today's World Insight. Chinese President Xi Jinping headlines the Boao Forum for Asia with a call for a global security initiative among nations to navigate storm of challenges. Up close with former Chinese ambassador to the U.S. Sui Tiankai, who talks about how Asia can pull together and steering toward world peace. What is important is that with all such communication, people should put their policy statements, their commitments into practice. Hello and welcome to World Insight with me, Tianwei, in Boao. At the opening ceremony of the annual meeting of the Boral Forum for Asia, Chinese President Xi Jinping announced for the very first time to the world the Global Security Initiative. It's believed to be an important component of China's foreign policy principles after the country proposed to the world the Global Development Initiative. Stay committed to abiding by the purposes and principles of the UN Charter, reject Cold War mentality, oppose unilateralism and say no to group politics and block confrontation. Stay committed to taking the legitimate security concerns of all countries seriously, uphold the principle of indivisible security, build a balanced, effective and sustainable security architecture, and oppose the pursuit of one's own security at the cost of others' security. Stay committed to peacefully resolving differences and disputes between countries through dialogue and consultation. Support all efforts conducive to the peaceful settlement of crises, reject double standards, and oppose the wanton use of unilateral sanctions and long-arm jurisdiction. Stay committed to maintaining security in both traditional and non-traditional domains, and work together on regional disputes and global challenges such as terrorism, climate change, cybersecurity, and biosecurity. As the world is burdened with challenges like the pandemic, the geopolitics, regional conflicts, and economic uncertainties, many hope both the Global Development Initiative and the Global Security Initiative can help the world better weather the global storms. Also at the Boal Forum for Asia's annual meeting today, I moderated a panel with experts on this topic on how to bridge the great divergence the world is facing now. Former Prime Minister of Japan Yatsuo Fukuda and former Vice Premier of China Zheng Peiyan shared their insights. And the panelists, like the former Chinese ambassador to the United States, Cui Tiankai, and Harvard professor Joseph Nye and others, exchanged their views on how to seek common ground despite apparent differences. On the sideline of the forum, I talked to Ambassador Cui Tiankai in an exclusive interview. As the Chinese ambassador to the U.S., Cui Tiankai served as a crucial bridge between the two countries for more than eight years. Together with his teams, Cui tried to navigate all the uncertainties along the way. Also, he has rich experiences in the multilateral work and expertise in Asia after serving as China's ambassador to Japan for several years. He discussed in the interview his understanding of the importance of Asia, as well as the significance of developing and emerging countries today. Ambassador Cui Tiankai, what a pleasure to see you once again. It's my great pleasure again. Ambassador Cui, China has been talking about the global Development Initiative, GDI. And today at the Boao Forum for Asia opening ceremony, Chinese president proposed a, a global security initiative. A lot of these initiatives, but many wonder whether the words being expressed, uh, the meaning of it is being shared. Well, President Xi Jinping made a very important speech this morning at the opening ceremony of the Boao Forum. He put forward the idea of global security initiative. And together with the Global Development Initiative, I think they stand for the goals of China's foreign policy, global peace and global development. I think these are the real challenges facing the international community. Now the, 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 the problem is not how to define these terms. 
I think the problem for some of the countries, some of the so-called major countries, is whether they have the political will to commit themselves to these goals, whether they are willing to implement their commitment for the common benefit, for the common interests of the world. That's the real issue. Mr. Ambassador, some already suggesting that we are in the middle of a new Cold War or Cold War 2.0. I know you disagree with those terminologies. I asked you that question before. But what do you make of the reality? Where are we now? I think we are at, the, at a very important crossroads in global history. Where should we go? Are we going to build together a community of nations for a shared future? a bright future for everybody, or are we going back to the darkness of a global wars, confrontations, block politics, and the so-called Cold War? I think that people have to be very careful when they talk about this so-called new Cold War. I hope they remember during the old Cold War years, we had two major hot wars in Asia, which caused a lot of suffering to the Asia Pacific region. I think we, people in Asia and the Pacific region, we certainly reject any attempt to reinitiate such a cold war or even hot war. Mr. Ambassador, your uh, former counterpart, the former U.S. Ambassador to China, Max Balk, has recently in an interview talking about his thoughts uh, where we are today. He said it's not necessarily we're entering into a Cold War of a nuclear Cold War, but rather Cold War of culture and technologies. Of course, he's not saying that we are in the middle of a Cold War, but rather he's saying he's warning against the, the danger of moving into it. Do you agree with him? I fully share the concerns of my good friend, Max. I think he has pointed out this danger, this risk for the world. And this is quite real. I don't know why some people are so obsessed with block confrontation with so-called new Cold War or confrontation among major powers. Because we are now witnessing major fundamental changes in the world. And there are global challenges like the pandemic, climate change, poverty, food security, energy security, all these global challenges, they require global efforts. They require that all the members of the international community work together to promote our common interests, to safeguard the well-being of our people, and to build a better future for everybody. So I think it's, it's really worrying that or even alarming, some of the people are advocating, again, returning to power politics, block confrontations, and even Cold War or hot wars. Maybe what they want to have as a, the new Cold War could be in a different form. As you said, it may not be a nuclear war. It could be a war of culture, technology, but I, don't think, I think the consequences would be the same or even worse, because they are trying to divide the global community into different blocks to serve their own narrow interests, while the real need is for all of us to unite, to come together. Ms. Ambassador, though, uh, we have seen some uh, recent uh, uh, cases in which uh, once again challenge us about uh, how we can work together. Uh, for example, we have seen uh, from the very top leadership to the administration officials from both China and the United States uh, try to uh, communicate with one another. You personally, during your tenure as ambassador to the U.S., also try to facilitate some of these occasions. But the readouts that the media have uh, read after those meetings and interactions seem to be of two very different versions. What does that mean uh, even about the quality of communication? Well, first of all, I think communication at different levels between those countries is extremely important. And the most important thing 
is the communication at the top level. Good communication and the working relationship at the top is the most important asset for the relationship. So in the last few months, in the last year or so, President Xi had two video meetings with President Biden, and they had a couple of uh, phone calls, and there have been communication between uh, people at different levels, including most recently between the two defense ministers. I think these, these are good. These are good. Of course, at all these meetings, in all levels of communication, each side would emphasize or outline its position, its views on many of the issues, including on bilateral relations and uh, international regional issues. This is normal, this is natural. So for the readout, maybe each side would like to focus more on its own position. I think that this is also to be expected, to say the least. Mm -hmm. What is important is that when the leaders, political leaders of one country say something to political leaders of another country, this is a very serious statement. This is a very serious political statement. Very often it's commitment, it's policy statement. So when they say this, they should mean it and they should put it into practice. They cannot say one thing and do quite different things. That's not good. So the real problem between China and the United States is not that we don't have communication at all. Of course, we should enhance and increase communication, but we do have certain communications. What is important is that with all such communication, people should put their policy statements, their commitment into practice. They should translate their words into action. That's most important, and that's a real problem for the relation. I always believe for all communications, it's goodwill for goodwill and good faith for good faith. But Mr. Ambassador, I'm sure some of the latest news uh, you are also being informed. For example, at the uh, uh, finance minister of the G20 meetings, uh, uh, some of those countries walked out. One, well, representative of one country uh, spoke. Uh, uh, due to the re recent uh, regional conflict. So how do you see you know, the realities once again versus uh, you know, the ideal world that we want to have and we want to maintain? I think it's very unfortunate. So many things are being politicized nowadays. For instance, the international financial architecture. It was built over the decades. It has gone through a long years of evolution and reform and change. Some of the countries, actually, they took the lead. They played a very important role in establishing such an international financial and trade structure. But now they believe this does not serve their interests so well, it seemed to them. So they are trying to destroy the international architecture to undercut international governance. I think this is very short-sighted and narrow-minded. As President Xi Jinping said this morning, we are all in the same boat. If you try to throw somebody, somebody overboard, it will not help yourself. If you try to undermine this sophisticated and integrated apparatus, you will eventually hurt yourself. So I hope these people will really listen to such good advice. Mr. Ambassador, how do you look at China's relationship with the United States, with the quote unquote, the West, and also China's relationship with uh, developing countries, emerging economies? Well, I think you have raised a very interesting and a very important point. How do we see today's world? Very often people are so preoccupied with the uh, relations among the so-called major powers or major countries. But we in China, we never believe that global affairs should be totally in the hands of the so-called major countries or major powers. 
we don't believe that the international community should totally rely on major power politics. And we are certainly opposed to power politics because this is not fair. This is not very much in line with the shared values of the humanity. Peace, development, equity, justice, democracy, freedom. I think we should realize, and hopefully people in the so-called West could also give full recognition to the fact that after the Second World War, in the last seven decades or more, a large number of developing countries have come to the global stage. They started with winning political independence. Then they made genuine efforts to develop themselves. As they grow up economically and politically, they want to have their say in global governance. This is a very positive, very important development. It is changing the global structure in a very fundamental way. And China is part of this group of developing countries. We are always part of this group of developing countries. The world is changing fast, taking all our lives with it. But we can change it too, by seeking answers to problems through discussions and debates. On World Insight, I ask direct questions to real people in the know, seek genuine answers, but respect diverse perspectives. Our live global debates tackle the most critical issues head on. World Insight with Tian Wei, go beyond the headlines. You are to speak, Mr. Ambassador, at the BOA Forum for Asia. And I know Asia is very dear to your heart because you work for the you know, the Asian Affairs Department when you were at the uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs, you, you work as ambassador to Japan for several years also. Uh, the Chinese top leader talking about Asia to be able to maintain its stability, peace, and also create a united market. Now, realistically speaking, how far are we from there? Well, I think it's fair to say in the last few decades, we countries in the Asia Pacific region, we have made very good progress. On the whole, we have maintained regional stability. And now East Asia is one of the major engines for the global economy. Something people could not imagine maybe 30 or 40 years ago. This is very good for the region and for, for the world as a whole. And I think the Asian people, people in the Asia Pacific should take the credit for this. So we should continue this joint efforts. We should continue this historical process of closer regional cooperation, of friendly relations among the regional countries, of making joint efforts for common security and common prosperity. But what is alarming is that there are ongoing attempts to disrupt this process or even to reverse it. I don't know why some people are so obsessed with going back to the so-called old war years. I do hope they will remember the two hot wars in Asia during the Cold War years. It is really alarming uh, that uh, pressures are being given to these countries in the Asia in the Asian region to let them to stand the so-called in camps, whether with one group or with another. Uh, you know, what can these countries do? They feel helpless in this regard, uh, even though they have been speaking out both uh, in Washington and other capitals against this, but the reality still bites. Well, I've been talking to some of my Asian friends about this, and they are truly worried that there are ongoing pressures on them to take side 
so to speak. But it's never been China's policy to force other countries to take side. We believe that all of us, China, United States, countries in Asia Pacific, we should all to be on the right side of history. For any particular country in the region or outside, the side that they should take is the long-term interests of their own people. This is the right side. And they should go along the historical trend, what is required by global peace and development. We should be all on the same side or in the same boat. China is developing very fast, second largest economy in terms of GDP in the world, a very key figure in the international arena, uh, one of the P5, and therefore everything that China does is being studied with a microscope, some say. How do you look at the realities that uh, everything China does is going to be interpreted probably in more uh, than uh, they should? Uh, by the rest of the world. And as a result, how should China communicate with the rest of the world and also be able to uh, make sure things being done is well understood domestically and internationally? Well, you see, when we talk about the rest of the world vis-a-vis -vis China, we have to recognize there are very different groups, different countries in the rest of the world. You have the United States, you have Japan, you have Europe, but also you have a large number of developing countries in Asia, Africa, Middle East, Latin America. I think their attitude, their response to China's development are very different. Some people in the so-called developed world, I don't know for what reason, but they may get worried or even scared for no good reason at all about China's development. But the overwhelming majority of the global population living in the developing country, they are very happy about this. They welcome it because they see the possibility for their own country to grow stronger, richer, and they don't have to follow any, anything imposed on them by a few developing countries. So the developing countries, on the whole, they see China's development as a good opportunity for them. If China could follow its own path of development and succeed, then they could also do it. They are very happy about that. So I have told them, many of my friends in America and other countries. Please don't tell us you are speaking for the international community. You only account for a small part of a global population. You are not the global opinion. You are not the international community. You are just a small part of it. We see the world is evolving very fast and later this year, midterm election in the United States are also likely to take place we know it's a political war, and yet uh, with uh, bilateral relations uh, so important to both countries, it's very likely this uh, China-U.S. relationship will be uh, experiencing some polit uh, political turbulence. So how do you see China and the rest of the world, uh, quoting your earlier phrase, uh, could uh, be able to go through this process in a safer way uh, for a a better prospect for most of the world, sir? Well, first of all, election in the United States are part of the domestic politics of the United States itself. Of course, when I was working there, I witnessed a lot of uh, problems for the U.S. itself. The anger, the frustration felt by the people, but basically, this is their domestic affairs. My hope is that whatever happens to their domestic politics 
will not hijack relations between China and the United States. And hopefully, American foreign policy would really aim at the long-term common interests of our two peoples and of the global community. That's point one. Number two, I think people, especially the policymakers in the United States, they have to recognize all countries have the right to seek its own development according to its own national condition. This is a legitimate right for all countries. They don't have to follow any particular example, anything imposed by our side. Frankly, I think some people in America or maybe even in Europe, they still believe that they are somehow superior to other countries or their race is superior to other races. Now, nowadays, very few people will say this openly, but they still have this kind of mentality, this kind of mindset. You can feel it. And hopefully they could really catch up with the 21st century, get rid of such outdated mentality, this kind of very narrow bias, prejudice. If they can really open their mind, then I don't think any foreign policy issue would be so difficult to handle. They will clearly find common interests, mutual needs, and common goals. Thank you so much, Ambassador Cui Tiankai, for being with us. Really appreciate it, sir. Thank you. My great pleasure. That's my exclusive interview with the longest-serving Chinese ambassador to the United States, Mr. Cui Tiankai. And that will be all for today's program. You can find us on YouTube, Twitter, and Facebook. From Bo Ao and my team in Beijing, thank you for being with us, and I'll see you tomorrow.